Section two of Astounding Stories eleven November nineteen thirty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Wall of Death by Victor Rousseau. Part two. Kay rushed to the automatic clerk at the window beside the metal steps, taking care to avoid contact with them. Within six feet, the temperature of his body brought the thermostatic control into action. The window slid upward, and the dummy appeared. He turned the dial to Albany. "'I want New York Division. Substation F. Loyalist Registration,' he called. "'Give me Z numbers of the lottery, please.' "'No numbers will be given out until horometer 13,' the dummy boomed. "'But I tell you I must know immediately,' Kay pleaded frantically. "'Stand away, please. I've got to know, I tell you. We are now electrified. Last warning.' "'Listen to me. My name's Kay Bevan. I—' A mighty buffet in the chest hurled Kay ten feet backward upon the ground. He rose, came within the electric zone, felt his arms twisted in a giant's grasp, staggered back again and sat down gasping. The window went down noiselessly. The dummy swung back into place. Kay got upon his feet again, choking with impotent rage. All about him men and women were milling in a frantic mob. He broke through them, went back to where his plane was standing. A minute later he was driving madly toward the district airport in New York, within three blocks of Ruth's apartment. He dropped into a vacant landing place, checked hastily, and rushed into the elevator. Once in the upper street he bounded to the middle platform, and not satisfied to let it convey him at eight miles an hour, strode on through the indignant throng until he reached his destination. Hurling the crowds right and left, he gained the exit, and half a minute later was on the upper level of the apartment block. He pushed past the janitor and raced along the corridor to Ruth's apartment. She would be in if all was well. She worked for the Broadcast Association, correcting the proofs that came from the district headquarters by pneumatic tube. He stopped outside the door. The little dial of white light showed him that the apartment was unoccupied. As he stood there in a daze, hoping against hope, he saw a thread hanging from the crevice between door and frame. He pulled at it, and drew out a tiny strip of scandium, the new compressible metal that had become fashionable for engagement rings. Plastic, all but invisible, it could be compressed to the thickness of a sheet of paper. It was the token of secret lovers, and Kay had given Ruth a ring of it. It was the signal, the dreaded signal that Ruth had been on the lottery list, the only signal that she had been able to convey, since stringent precautions were taken to prevent the victims becoming known until all possibility of rescue was removed. No chance of rescuing her. From a hundred airports the great government airships had long since sailed into the skies, carrying those selected by the wheel of Washington for sacrifice to the earth giants. Only one chance remained. If Cliff had discovered the secret that had so long eluded them, surely he would reveal it to him now. Their quarrel was forgotten. Kay only knew that the woman he loved was even then speeding southward to be thrown into the maw of the vile monsters that held the world in terror. Surely Cliff would bend every effort to save her. Only a few hours had passed since Kay had stormed out of the laboratory in the Adirondacks in a rage when he was back on their little private landing field. He leaped from the plain and ran up the trail beside the lake between the trees. The cabin was dark, and when Kay reached the laboratory he found it dark too. "'Cliff! Cliff!' he shouted. No answer came, and with a sinking heart he snapped the button at the door. It failed to throw the expected flood of light through the interior. With shaking hand, Kay pulled the little electron torch from his pocket, and its bright beam showed that the door was padlocked. He moved around to the window. The glass was unbreakable, but the ray from the torch showed that the interior of the laboratory had been dismantled, and the great top was gone. In those few hours Cliff, for reasons best known to himself, had removed the top, Kay's one hope of saving Ruth and he was gone. In that moment Kay went insane. He raved and cursed, calling down vengeance upon Cliff's head. Cliff's very motive was incredible. That he had deliberately removed the top in order that Ruth should die was not, of course, conceivable. But in that first outburst of fury 
Kay did not consider that. Presently Kay's madness burned itself out. There was still one thing that he could do. His plane, slow though it was, would carry him to the Pampas. He could get fresh fuel at numerous bootleg petrol stations, even though the regulations against intersectional flight were rigid. With luck he could reach the Pampas, perhaps before the sluggish monsters had fallen upon their prey. It was said that the victims sometimes waited for days. Something was rubbing against his leg, pricking it through his anklets. Kay looked down. A lady porcupine, with tiny new quills, was showing recognition, even affection, if such a spiny beast could be said to possess that quality. Somehow the presence of the beast restored Kay's mind to normal. "'Well, he's left us both in the lurch, Susie,' he said. "'Good luck to you, beastie, and may you find a secure hiding-place until your quills have grown.' Drowning men catch at straws. Kay snatched out his watch, and the illuminated dial showed that it was already two quintets past horometer thirteen. He darted back to the cabin. The door was unfastened, and his torch showed him that though Cliff had evidently departed and taken his things— the interior was much as it had been. When Kay picked up the telephotophone, the oblong dial flashed out. The instrument was in working order. He turned the crank, and swiftly a succession of scenes flashed over the dial. On this little patch of glassite, Kay was actually making the spatial journey to Albany, each minutest movement of the crank representing a distance covered. The building of the New York Division appeared, and its appearance signified that Kay was telephonically connected. But there was no automatic voice attachment, an expense that Kay and Cliff had decided would be unjustified. He had to rely upon the old-fashioned telephone, such as was still widely in use in rural districts. He took up the receiver. "'Substation F, loyalist registration, please,' he called. "'Speaking,' said a girl's voice presently. "'I want the Z-numbers, all from Z-5 to Z-A,' said K. And thus, in the dark hut, he listened to the doom pronounced. Miles away, by a more or less indifferent operator. When the fatal number was read out, he thanked her and hung up. He released the crank, which moved back to its position, putting out the light on the dial. For a moment or two he stood there motionless, in a sort of daze, though actually he was gathering all his reserves of resolution for the task confronting him, simply to find Ruth among the hundred thousand victims and die with her. A task stupendous in itself, and yet Kay had no doubt that he would succeed, that he would be holding her in his arms when the tide of hell flowed over them. He knew the manner of that death, the irresistible onset of the giant masses of protoplasm, the extrusion of temporary arms or feelers that would grasp them, drag them into the heart of the yielding substance, and slowly smother them to death while the life was drained from their bodies. It had been said the death was painless, but that was government propaganda. But he would be holding Ruth in his arms. He'd find her. He had no doubt of that at all. And strangely enough, now that Kay knew the worst, now that not the slightest doubt remained, he was conscious of an elevation of spirits, a sort of mad recklessness that was perfectly indefinable. Kay turned his torch into a corner of the kitchen. Yes, there was the thing subconsciousness had prompted him to seek, a long-shafted, heavy woodsman's axe, a formidable weapon at close quarters, because it is the instinct of Homo Americanus to die with a weapon in his hands, rather than let himself be butchered helplessly. Kay snatched it up. He ran back to his plane. The gas tank was nearly empty, but there was petrol in the ice house beside the lake. Kay wheeled the machine up to it and filled up with gas and oil. All ready now. He leaped in, pressed the starter, soared vertically, helicopter wings fluttering like a soaring hawk's, up to the passenger air lane at nine thousand, higher to twelve, the track of the international and supply ships higher still to the fourteen thousand ceiling of the antiquated machine. He banked, turned southward. It was freezing cold up there, and Kay had no flying suit on him. But between the passenger lane and the lane of the heliospheres, at thirty thousand, there was no air police, and he could afford to take no chances. The government police would be on the lookout for a score of such desperate men as he. 
bent on a similar mission. He drove the plane toward the Atlantic till a red glow began to diffuse itself beneath him, an area of conflagration covering square miles of territory. Swooping lower, Kay could hear the sound of detonations, the roar of old-fashioned guns, while through the pall of lurid smoke came the long, violet flashes of atomic guns, cleaving lanes of devastation. New York was burning. The frenzied populace had broken into revolt, seized the guns stored in the arsenals, and attacked the great Bronx fortress that stood like a mighty sentinel to protect the port. A swarm of airships came into view, swirling in savage fight. Kay zoomed. It was not his battle. Now New York lay behind him, and he was winging southward over the Atlantic. All night he flew. At dawn he came down in a coast hamlet for bootleg petrol and oil. "'You come from New York?' asked the Georgian. "'Here there's war broke out up there.' "'My war's down in Brazil,' muttered Kay. Say, if them giants comes up here, you know what us folks is going to do? We're going to set the hounds on em. Yes, siree. We've got a pack of bloodhounds, raised for just that purpose. I guess that's something them wisecrackers at Washington ain't thought of. They took two little fellers from Hopetown, but they won't take nobody from here. Kay fueled up and resumed his flight southward. After that it was a nightmare. The sun rose and set, alternating with the staring moon and stars. Kay crossed the Caribbean, sighted the South American coast, swept southward over the jungles of Brazil. He drank, but no food passed his lips. He had become a mechanism, set for on special purpose, self-immolation. It was in a wide savanna among the jungles that he first caught sight of the monsters. At first he thought it was the rising dawn mist. Then he began to distinguish a certain horrible resemblance to human forms, and swooped down, banking round and round the opening in the jungle until he could see clearly. There were perhaps a score of them, an advance guard that had pushed forward from one of the main divisions. Men? Athropoids, rather, for their sex was indistinguishable. Human forms ranging from a few feet to a hundred, composed apparently of a grayish jelly, propelling themselves clumsily on two feet but floating rather than walking. Translucent, semi-transparent, most horrible of all, these shadowy, spheroid creatures exhibited here and there buds of various sizes, which were taking on the similitude of fresh forms, and among them were the young, the buds that had fallen from the parent stems, fully formed humans of perhaps five or six feet, bouncing with a horrible playfulness among their sires. As Kay soared some three hundred feet overhead, a young taper came leaping out of the jungle and ran, apparently unconscious of their presence, right toward the monsters. Suddenly it stopped, and Kay saw that it was already encircled by coils of protoplasm, resembling arms, which had shot forth from the bodies of the devils. Swiftly, despite its struggles and bleatings, the taper was drawn into the substance of the monsters which seemed to fuse together and form a solid wall of protoplasm in all respects, like the agglutination of bacteria under certain conditions. Then the beast vanished in the wall, whose agitated churnings alone gave proof of its existence. For perhaps ten minutes longer Kay remained hovering above the clearing. Then the bodies divided, resuming their separate shapes, and the white bones of the taper lay in a huddled mass in the open. Kay went mad. Deliberately he set down his plane, and, hatchet in hand, advanced upon the sluggish monsters. Shouting wildly, he leaped into their midst. The fight that followed was like a nightmare fight. He lopped off the slow tentacles that sought to envelop him. He slashed the devils into long ribbons of writhing jelly, slashed until the substance blunted the axe, wiped it clean and leaped into their midst again, hewing until he could no longer raise his arm. Then he drew back and surveyed the scene before him. It was dreadful enough to drive the last remnants of sanity from his brain, for every piece that he had cut from the monsters, every protoplasmic ribbon, was reorganizing before his eyes into the semblance of a new creature. Where there had been a score, there were now five hundred. Kay ran back to his plane, leaped in, and soared southward. His face was a grotesque mask of madness, and his cries rang out through the ether. The victims were no longer chained to stakes. The Federation, which always acted with complete secrecy, had gone one better. 
It had engaged electrical engineers, kept them housed in secret places, transported them to Golgotha, and there a vast electrified field had been established, an open space whose boundaries were marked out by pillars of electron steel. Between these pillars ran lines of electric force. To attempt to pass them meant not death, for dead boys and girls were spurned by the devils, but a violent shock that hurled one backward. On this great plain the hundred thousand victims sat huddled in the open. Food they had none, for no purpose was to be served by mitigating their last agonies. No shelter either, for the sight of buildings might delay the final phase. But high above the doomed there floated the flag of the Federation, on a lofty pole, a touch of ironic sentimentality that had commended itself to some mind at Washington. Over a square mile of territory, ringed with jungle, the victims lay. The majority of them ringed this terrain. That is to say, attempting to escape, they had been hurled back by the electrical charge, and having no strength or will remaining, they had dropped where they had been hurled, and lay in apathetic resignation. There had been screams and cries for mercy, and piteous scenes when the government airships had deposited them there and flown away. But now an intense silence had descended upon the doomed. Resigned to their fate, they sat or lay in little silent groups, all eyes turned toward the gloomy jungle. And everywhere, within this jungle, a wraith-like mist was forming at this dawn hour. From a thousand miles around, the devils were mustering for their prey agglutinating, in order that the meal of one might become the meal of all. Wisps of protoplasmic fog were stealing out through the trees, changing shape every instant, but always advancing. Now presenting the appearance of an aligned regiment of huge, shadowy men, now nothing but a wall of semi-solid vapor, and still, with eyeballs straining in their sockets, the victims watched. Suddenly all were seized with the same spasm of mad terror. Again they hurled themselves against the electrified lines, and again they were hurled back, masses of boys and girls tumbling against one another, and screaming in one wail that, could it have been heard in Washington, would have driven all insane. Again and again, till they fell back, panting and helpless, and solidly the wall of devils was creeping up from every side. Ruth Dean, one of the few who had themselves in control, lay some distance back from the electrified field. From the moment when she was surprised in her apartment by the government representatives, she had known that there was no hope of escape. She had slipped the ring off her finger, snapped the plastic metal, and attached it to a thread torn from her dress. She had managed to insert it in the door, hoping that Kay would find it. It would serve as a last message of love to him. Every removal of a selected victim was in the nature of a kidnapping. At dead of night her apartment had been opened. She had been ordered to dress. Nothing could be written, no arrangements made. She was already considered as one dead. She had been hurried out of the upper entrance to the monorail, which conveyed her in a special car to the landing station. A few minutes later she had been on her way to join the camp of other victims, a hundred miles away. Within two hours she was on her way southward. Stunned by the tragedy, None of the victims had made much of an outcry. They had been given water by the airship police. No food for boys and girls already dead. Days and nights had passed, and now she was here, faint from exhaustion, and wondering at the despair shown by those others. What difference would it make in half an hour? Besides, that government pamphlet had insisted that this death was painless. But an immense longing to see Kay once more came over her. There had been a time when she thought she loved Cliff. Then Kay had come into her life, and she had known that other affair was folly. She had never told Kay of the bitter scene between Cliff and herself, how he had raved against Kay and sworn to win her in the end. Cliff had calmed down and apologized, and Ruth had never seen him again. She wished he had not taken it like that. But above all she wanted to see Kay, just to say good-bye and she tried to send out her whole heart to him in an unspoken message of love that would surely somehow convey itself to him. The wall of devils was creeping up on every side, slowly, lethargically. The monsters took their time, because they knew they were invincible. The sobs and shrieks had died away. Collected into a mass almost as rigid as that of the earth giants, the victims waited, 
palsied as a rabbit that awaits the approach of the serpent. A humming overhead. An airplane shooting down from the sky. Rescue? No. Only a solitary pilot armed with a woodsman's axe. Kay drifted down, touched the ground, leaped to his feet. Chance had brought him within five hundred yards of where Ruth was standing. But Ruth had known who that lone flyer must be. She broke through the throng. She rushed to meet him. Her arms were around him. Kay, darling Kay. Ruth, dearest, I knew you'd come. I've come to die beside you. It was perhaps odd that it did not enter the head of either as a possibility that Kay should simply place Ruth in the plane and fly away with her to safety. Had the thought occurred to Kay, he might have been tempted, but such black treachery was something inconceivable by either. So long as the Federation remained, so long as man moved in an organized society, he was bound to his fellows, to fight, suffer, and die with them. Stand by me, Ruth. We're going down fighting. They moved back toward the throng, which momentarily stirred to hope by Kay's appearance, had fallen into the former apathy of despair. And now the monsters were beginning to enter the electrified zone at one point. As they passed the line of posts, the high-tension current made their bodies luminous, but it had no appreciable effect upon them. They moved on, inevitably. A score or so of semi-human forms agglutinated into a mass, and yet individually discernible. They bore down slowly upon the crowd of victims, who pressed backward as they advanced. On the other sides, though they almost encircled the field of death, the monsters were making no maneuvers to entrap their prey. Their sluggish minds were incapable of conceiving anything of the kind. But for the electrified zone, the great majority of the victims could have effected their escape. The monsters were simply pressing forward to their meal. They did not interpret its capture in terms of strategy at all. A new frenzy of horror seized the crowd. They fled, struggling back until the foremost in flight reached the other side of Golgotha, to be repulsed by the electrified zone there. They fell in tumbled heaps. Appalling shrieks rang through the air. Another line of the monsters was seeping forward, converging toward the first. As the two lines met they coalesced into a wall of protoplasm, a thousand feet in length by a hundred high, a wall out of which leered phantasmal faces like those in a frieze. Kay stood alone, his arm around Ruth. To follow the flying mob would but prolong the agony. He raised the axe. He looked into the girl's eyes. She understood, and nodded. One last embrace, one kiss, and Kay placed her behind him. He sprang forward, shouting, and plunged into the very heart of the wall. And Ruth, watching with eyes dilated with horror, saw it yield with a sucking sound, and saw Kay disappear within it. She saw the hideous mass fold itself upon him, and a hundred extruded tentacles wave in the air as they blindly grappled for him. And then Kay had broken through, and was hewing madly with great sweeps of the axe that slashed great streamers of the amorphous tissue from the wall of protoplasm. It recoiled and then folded once more, and Kay's mighty sweeps were slashing phantom limbs from phantom bodies, and lopping off tentacles that curled and coiled, and put forth caricatures of hands and fingers, and then uniting with other slashed-off tentacles began to mold themselves into the likeness of dwarf monsters. Kay's struggle was like that of a man fighting a fog, for again and again he broke through the wall, and always it reunited and behind it another wall of protoplasm was pressing forward, and on another side a wall was drifting up. As Kay stopped, panting, and momentarily free, Ruth saw that they were almost encircled. She saw the nature of that fight. Inevitably that wall would close about them, and though the bones of last year's victims had been gathered up and carried away by the Federation, she guessed what would occur. She ran to Kay and dragged him back through the closing gap. It met behind them, and again they stood face to face with the devils. Only this time, instead of a wall of protoplasm, it was a veritable mountain that confronted them, and there could be no more breaking through. Kay thought afterward that the one touch of absolute horror was that the reforming monsters, the young ones growing visibly before his eyes, had the gambling instinct of young lambs or other creatures. 
They were much more lively than the parent creatures. End of Part 2